Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series has been on the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, those two little books that are a little bit in front of the first half of the Bible. And this is the final lesson in that series entitled Leaders in Israel. It's lesson number 13 for December 28 of 2019. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we have come once again to explore your word, to think about some of the issues that are discussed there and what kind of information, what kind of important uh, information that w- will be there for us. Help us to learn from these words that have been prepared for us what uh, you want us to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I hope you have fresh in your mind uh, this, all the lessons we've studied so far at the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. So now we're going to look back over the events recorded in these two books and, and compare the leadership capacity and, and, and abilities of these two men with some other people in Scripture at different times and see what great leaders they actually were. And when we talk about leaders... Um, I like to, because I studied this quite a bit in, when I was in medicine, to watch children to see who turns, to be, turns out to be the leader and why do other children follow that person. Well, here's a question for Ezra and Nehemiah. Why did people choose to put their lives on the line to follow these two men? That's one of the questions we're going to try to answer as we discuss today. And, of course, we would agree, I hope, that Part of the reason why people chose to follow them is because they had a special relationship with God. So that's another part of the picture. So we need to remember, it's nice for us to think, okay, I've got my computer, I've got my cell phone, I've got my Bible at least, I can flip the pages. They had no Bible. The only thing they had was a scroll, two or or two or three here, and maybe some of them that were more wealthy had several scrolls each one of those scrolls would have one book on it, or maybe two of the little of the little books. And the Old Testament hadn't even hadn't been finally written yet. There was still Malachi to be written, and these books themselves of of Ezra and Nehemiah would would have needed to still be written when when the story begins. So it wasn't just an easy job to flip open the Scripture and read what you what God inspires to tell you. Well. Do you think that some of the people memorize much of the scripture? Yes. Because I, I do. you know, people today memorize songs, they memorize this and that. But we have the Bible that we can pick up and read any time. We don't need to memorize it. Yeah. But maybe they memorized large portions. We we know for a fact that by the time of Jesus, the schools, the schools of the the rabbis one of their main challenges was to get the young men, because the women didn't go to school in those days, to, re, uh, to memorize great portions of Scripture. And we're told that a few of them memorized the entire Bible in the original language. That would be Hebrew and some sort se- short sections in, in Aramaic. So that just blows me away to think about that. But yes, they did. Did the school of the prophets exist at this time? Uh, Probably not. Probably the school of prophets ceased to exist when when Jerusalem was destroyed. So now they're coming back. And I wouldn't be surprised if Ezra tried to reestablish something like that, but we have no nothing written about that, no words that that was the case. Um, and, and of course, ultimately, we'd like to know what can we learn from their experiences. We do know that they had access to certain inspired records. In fact, we're going to find out, and we're going to review this again a little bit later, that Ezra was probably, almost certainly, the first person to actually collect scrolls. Every scroll he could find, he would go around, do you have any scrolls? Do you have any scrolls? Do you have any scrolls? Any scrolls? Any scrolls? Any scrolls? And then he would, he put them together. He was the first one that sort of said, okay, here are the books of the Bible, and here's how we're going to put them together. Now, I should tell you that... um, Hebrew Bibles today, the ones that the Jews themselves use, are organized a little differently than our Bibles. Second Chronicles, for example, is the last book of their 
uh, Bible, in what we would call the Old Testament, and some other things. That the arrangement's a little different, but that that's not a huge, big issue. So we need to ask another question that Bible scholars and people who deal with this issue always ask. Were there other non-inspired writings around that Ezra and Nehemiah would have to look at and say, well, no, that one doesn't belong in this collection, and but these do belong. We just don't know. We just do not know if there. We know that within a couple hundred years after that, a lot of those uninspired writings uh, uh, began to appear. But at their time, we don't know if there were any or not. And there must have been uh, a number of things that got lost because as you read through First Second Samuel and Kings, they'll ref. Refer- reference uh, the book there of are, Nathan the prophet or some, there are some 20, such thing. 23 sources referenced in First and Second Chronicles which we have no record of. Now it's possible that some of the names may be a slightly different variation of a name to something which we do have. We don't know that for sure but if we take the name strictly the, we have, we have there are 24 references that we don't have anymore. And the question is, were all those references inspired? We don't know. We don't know. It sounds like some of them were just records of the events that happened in under the King of the Kingdom of David, for example. Um, Book of the Chronicles of yeah, David the King or something like that. That kind of stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna now we're gonna take several stories and we're gonna look at them just briefly. Uh, we're going to hope that we don't have time to read all these things in detail. So we're going to hope that you have some pretty good memory of some of these stories. First Kings chapter 12, verses 1 to 16, is the story of Rehoboam. Now, if you remember, Rehoboam was, we don't know if he was the eldest son, probably the eldest son of Solomon, and the one that was chosen for whatever reason to be the next king. And when his father died and he took over, he was still quite young, and he remember he called different groups of people and said, "Okay, what do you recommend that I should do?" And the elders who had been advisors to his father said, "If you want everything to be good and you want the people to stay on your side, uh, you need to re- reduce the taxes and, and uh, you know reduce the requirements you make of them and so forth. Otherwise, we're going to have a rebellion on our hands." And, of course, he called in his young friends and they said, make the taxes even more. We want to we want to live happy. We want to live like Solomon did. We want to have plenty of money coming in. Tax them even more. And the result, of course, was that uh, 10 of the tribes, the 10 northern tribes, uh, rebelled against uh, Rehoboam and, and joined the side of, of um, Jeroboam. So... Unfortunately, there are people like Rehoboam, a lot of people like Rehoboam, who make serious errors, serious errors because they don't think about what effects their behavior might have on other people. Then we, we come to the New Testament, and Acts 15, verses 7 to 11. Here's a different story. Roland, I think you can read that for us. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they wow now of course he's referring back to what experience Cornelius 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 was a Gentile that had come to see him and Joppa not only a Gentile he was a Roman and he was a centurion of all things. Yes. And yet, God used him and to, uh, to really 
change the atmosphere with Peter. Peter, you'll notice in the text that says a little while later, he didn't um, really want to go because he had to take six of his brethren with him as witnesses. Yes. And he, he did it, but he said, Lord, maybe I better have somebody else along too. Exactly. <clears throat> and, and he needed them when it was time to go back to Jerusalem. He really did because he needed support to, because they asked him, why did you do this? Mm -hmm. And he said, because God did it. God instructed us and there he went. And then he said, what did he say? What was his conclusion? God poured out his Holy Spirit on them. As he Cornelius did Cornelius and his family and his friends who were visited there, just as he did to us. Right. Wow. Pretty hard to argue with God if you really care about God's message, right? So, and, and Peter was doing this as a critical time because remember that that Paul and, and Barnabas had gone out. They had traveled to mostly Gentile territory, converted a number of Jews, but also converted a number of Gentiles. And now they're coming back and people down in Jerusalem saying, hold on, wait, 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 wait. We want the Christian church to be a subdivision of the, Jew, of the of Jews, not Gentiles. And Peter finally, after Paul and Barnabas had spoken up and others had spoken up, Peter comes up and he says, you know what? Well, there's no reason for us to argue about this. God himself Has answered, answered this question. Bang. And that was sufficient to convince the group that that was the right thing to do. Another story. Going back to the Old Testament now is found in 2 Kings 23, 1-10. Let me just read this briefly. King Josiah summoned all of the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem and together they went to the temple accompanied by the priests and the prophets and all the rest of the people, rich and poor alike. Before them all, the king read aloud the whole book of the covenant which had been found in the temple. Probably the book of Deuteronomy. We're not sure, but possibly. He stood by the royal column and made a covenant with the Lord to obey him, to keep his laws and covenants, commands with all his heart and soul and to put into practice the demands attached to the covenant as written in the book. And all the people promised to keep the covenant. Then Josiah ordered the high priest Hilkiah, his assistant priest and the guards on duty at the entrance of the temple to bring out of the temple all the objects used in worship of Baal, of the goddess Asherah, and of the stars. So what are we? Let's think about what's happening here. The holy place and the most holy place in Solomon's temple are being filled w with these pagan objects of worship, and people are going there to Solomon's temple to worship these things. And what's Josiah saying? Get that junk out of here, right? The king burnt all those objects outside the city near the valley of the Kidron. And then he had the ashes taken to Bethel. He removed from office of priests that the kings of Judah had ordained to offer sacrifices on the pagan altars in the city of Judah and in places near Jerusalem. All the priests who offered sacrifices to Baal, to the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. He removed from the temple the symbol of the goddess Asherah, took it out of the city to the valley of the Kidron, burnt it and pounded its ashes to dust and scattered it over the public burial ground. I mean, and you... I guess we can read the rest of these few verses. He destroyed the living quarters in the temple occupied by the temple prostitutes. In Solomon's temple, there were living temple prostitutes. It was there that women wove, ro wove robes used in the worship of Asherah, the goddess of, of fertility. He brought to Jerusalem priests who were the, in the cities of Judah and throughout the whole country. He desecrated the altars where they had offered sacrifice. He also tore down the altars dedicated the goat demons near the gate built by Joshua, the city governor, which was to the left of the main gate as one enters the city. Those priests were not allowed to serve in the temple, but they could eat the unleavened bread provided for their fellow priests. King Josiah also desecrated Tophet, the pagan place of worship in the valley of Hinnom, so that no one could sacrifice his son or daughter as a burnt offering to the god Molech, right outside of Solomon's temple in the valley, right next to it. They were burning their children as, a, as, a, as offerings to Molech. He also removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the worship of the sun, and he burnt the chariots used in this worship. These were kept in the temple courtyard. That's the place where Jesus had to clean things out in his day, near the gate and not far from the living quarters of Nathan Malik, a high official, and, and so forth. Wow. 
So, he did everything he could to get rid of the pagan priests and idols that had been placed in Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. He used whatever influence he could to restore the correct worship of God in the land of Judah. And then there's the story of Deborah. What do we know about Deborah? She was a prophetess. She was a prophetess and also a judge. judge. One of the judges in the book of Judges. And people came to her and asked her to, and do we have anywhere, you know, we don't know how she became a judge or who made that decision, but came to her and they got their, their people. Why would people come to her? Think about it. I, I I still can't figure out how she got to that position as a woman. Terrible thought. As a woman in that day. In that day. No, they they went to her because she had good advice. Of course. I mean, <laughs> of course. <isn't> it? <coughs> well, I mean, that's in the twenty first century. So, does that mean that we could have female leaders in our church if they give good advice? <laughs> Do the male leaders give good advice? Well, hold on now. No. Yeah, You're, that's always. a big good question. Okay, so what's happening? Remember that under Moses and uh, I'm not. It's now under Joshua. The children of Israel crossed the land of uh, across the river Jordan, captured Jericho, and then they made ca- several campaigns up and down the country and conquered most of the land. A, let's say a good portion of the land of Israel. When Joshua died, he said, "Okay, you people, you now you've seen how to do it. Go and conquer the rest of it, so all the land will belong to us." Many of them didn't do it. Some of the tribes didn't, didn't, didn't conquer any of the territory they were supposed to live in. For example, the tribe of Dan. Anyway. Isn't that a good thing that we don't go to war? Well, if God instructs you to go to war. And so, actually, shouldn't that's we, a good shouldn't question. We, shouldn't we negotiate? Well, let's talk about that for a second. What did God, why did God tell them to go into the land? And what did he tell, you to, tell them to do there? Wipe out the people. Eliminate what the things they worship. That was the reason. He said, scatter them out. If necessary, chase the people away. But most importantly, get rid of their gods. Get rid of the places they worship. Eliminate that stuff completely. You can read about that back in in um, Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy 20. It's clear, yeah, spelled out pretty somebody clear. Somebody also says that I will send hornets. Yes, so, perhaps he was failed in places, then he backed off. You see, I think Ellen White says it clearly that there, it was not the intention that any blood be shed. No. Um, God's plan was for them to be chased out of the territory. Yes. The children of Israel didn't want to do that because if, if, if the hornets come along and chase people out and they just walk into the territory, they don't get any credit for winning the war. You can't, I mean, why would we let God have all the credit? And what did Well, the, where do you read that? Huh? I mean, you're, you're, it sounds well, like you're kind of speculating no, about it, their it, motives. It, it actually talks about that. It, go go yeah. back and look at it. I can't tell you the verse no. right now, but it, basically, you, even as you follow on through the history of Israel, many times the basic idea is, well, we want to do this ourselves. And especially at the point where they chose to have a king. That's where they really came out with this idea. Well, so what's happening here, the kings from the north, they gathered a huge force and they thought, okay, we're going to come down and we're going to recapture the territory that Israel has taken from us. And Jabin was the king of uh, Hatzor at that point in time and he was the leader of the group. And what happened? They had iron chariots, which really means not the, the whole chariot wasn't iron. They had iron rims on their wheels so that the Wood wouldn't wear out so fa- so fast, but remember that without taking time to read the whole story, Deborah said to Barak, "God has chosen you, lead the the, 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 the our people." And they went and they gathered up on Mount Tabor, and, and Barak said, "Okay, hold on, I want to make sure God is with us, so I want you to be with us." So here's a woman who agrees to go with all these men and stand beside them and the front lines, and of course God fought for them and they conquered all these enemies. That's the story of Deborah and Barak. The next story is the story of 
King Ahab. And what was it that King Ahab... What do we know about King Ahab real quickly first? Not a very good man. He was not a very good man. One of the most... Evil, in fact. Evil man. His, His wife was probably more evil than himself. Yes. That is the problem. Yes. He married... A priestess. The, a priestess, the high priestess of Baal, whose father was the high priest of Baal over in Sidon. And she came over and she committed herself to convert all of the Israelites to become worshippers of Baal. That was her goal. At one point in time, we know that she had 850 Baal prophets, Baal and Ashtoreth prophets, working for her in this job of trying to convert Israelites. Just think about it. And she came very close to succeeding. She came she very close. She was a great evangelist. Yeah. Right? When they threw her over the wall and then uh, the dogs licked up her blood and there was nothing left. They yeah. er- basically erased her name, except now we do we do have that evidence. Yeah. But she has nothing and Unfortunately, good. she left a daughter who married a king from the southern kingdom of Judah and took over that kingdom for a little while. Well, anyway, so Ahab goes out and he sees a short distance from his place a beautiful vineyard that belongs to Naboth. And he wanted that vineyard. But he knew that God had assigned these territories and each person was, you know, you couldn't just go take it. This was their family inheritance. So Jezebel says, that's no problem. I'll arrange to have Naboth killed and then you can take it. And she did. Completely false, brewed up some story. And you can read about that in 1 Kings 21, 1-16. to well, we can see clearly from these stories that those who chose to follow Satan's example and acted out of selfish motives ended up being very evil. Those who followed God's advice, no matter how impossible it might have seemed to do, to, to do so, were blessed by Him. So we had a few ver- verbs, I mean verses, I'm sorry, that sort of summarized that whole thing. First Kings 15, 26, and 34. And I think, Charles, you have something on that? Yes. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father. And in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. So here we have a story of a king who follows evil plans for his life. And what happens? The people just follow him like blind sheep. I think you have another verse there. Yes. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Another king. Yes, and walked in the way of Jeroboam and his sin wherewith he led Israel to sin. Mm. There's another story that goes along with that found in Second Kings 13, 1-3 talking about Jeroboam himself. Anyway, that's, uh, that story was repeated again and again in the Old Testament. And these pictures just show us that frequently that you can read about if a good king would come along or a good leader even in, back in the days of the judges the people would obey for a while and then a bad one would come along and then maybe there'd be a little they would get into all kinds of trouble and then they, oh they come back to God and then they would do better for a little while and, they're in, and then next time they went even further into trouble and always it was it was just a downward there would be a little bump in the road but it was a downward course basically and remember that what God said to Elijah Elijah's after that experience with Jezebel and Ahab down there at Mount Horeb said, God, God, I'm the only one left. What did God say? Not quite. No. Not quite. <laughs> How many I have left? 7,000. 7,000, exactly right. Okay, coming back to the New Testament. Dennis, I think you have something for us there. Yes, this is John eleven forty-five to 53. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And okay, that, let's, let's that would be we, we, we probably need to just remind our audience, this is toward the end of the story of Jesus coming from the other side of the Jordan where it was safer for him to preach because they were looking for him. They were trying to get him to kill him. And he came over to Bethany and raised Lazarus to, to life after ha- after being dead four days. There was no question about anybody anybody's mind that he was dead. And of course, the Sadducees didn't believe that a person could be raised from the dead. If they're really dead, can't be raised to life. So, go ahead. 
Verse 47, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men uh, will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But then one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you, you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. Mm. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Okay, that's a really sad story. I mean, why did it say who was the high priest that year? Each year, the leading family would pay a lot of money to the Roman government for the permission of having their family be the high priest. That's what that's what had deteriorated too in the days of in the days of, of, of Jesus and so forth. And then, how did they get their money back? They were responsible for all the trafficking that went on in the courts, that, that stuff that Jesus drove out, the selling of animals and the money changing and all that kind of stuff. They collected the profits from that. Of course, they helped us, part of it went to support of the temple, but an awful lot of it went into their pockets. And now, what when he says that our whole nation not be destroyed, what is he talking about? Well, the Romans would come and destroy the nation if, uh, there was another uh, an uprising of some okay, type. Okay, but he's so. not talking about an uprising. What's he talking about? He's basically saying we will lose our jobs. That's what he's talking about. And maybe our lives because we'll f- people will find out what kind of scoundrels we are. So he, he wasn't concerned about the poor and the, and the other people out there. He was concerned about his job and the position that he held and says we can't have Jesus destroying us. We, we can take care of this one guy. He's not going to take the place of all of us. Well, as we already said, the Sadducees didn't believe it was possible for someone to rise from the dead. And he was really dead. What did, what did Martha say when Jesus came to the tomb? He already stinks. There will be a bad smell, as my good news Bible says very <laughs> very nicely. There will be a bad smell. But But, but you see... We all know Jesus tarried. He says, "Ah, that's all right." You know, he knew exactly what was going on. E- everything was coming to a climax, and we all agree. But you see, uh, per- perhaps uh, Caiaphas uh, 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 pro- he fulfilled the prophecy. Mm-hmm. He fulfilled the no. prophecy. Yeah, uh, he wasn't doing that on purpose. Uh, the, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is that uh, they were ready to, the commoners were ready to declare him the king. Exactly. And that's what they were worried about. There's going to be exactly. uprising, we're going to, going to be dead. Yeah. Uh, Romans are going to come and slaughter us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, Jesus knew when he left, when he left Bethany, <coughs> crossed the Jordan, I mean, he left the other side of Jordan, crossed the Jordan, and came up to Bethany and raised Lazarus from the dead. He knew that he would just sealed his doom. Because whereas the Sadducees pretty much controlled the temple and what was going on there, they didn't worry too much about what was going on outside. The Pharisees have been trying to kill Jesus since the very first Passover. And now it's four, three, four years, three years later. And, 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 but now that he raised someone from the dead, all of a sudden he's, ta- he's attacking the, one of the favorite doctrines of the Sadducees. And now, all of a sudden, Sadducees and Pharisees are cooperating, which almost never happened. we got to get rid of this guy. Is that the, like Republicans and Democrats com- cooperating? No. Gordon, why would you say such a thing? Or is thing? it even more radical than that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really radical. How many of our actions on a day-by-day basis are done, even if we realize there might be bad consequences because we want to stand up for the truth of God? Ezra and Nehemiah had very strong relationships with God. Those relationships were based on their understandings of God's statements from the scrolls and also from the time of fasting and prayer until their relationships with God were very close. Remember, 
before Nehemiah had an opportunity to say something to the emperor about going back and working in Jerusalem, he had fasted and prayed. We don't know what all that involved, but for four months. Okay. So, we've studied the, the story of Nehemiah. He did more uh, than fasting and praying. He planned. Yes, he planned. He planned very well. Some yes. would say he plotted. That has a little bit of a negative connotation. <laughs> he plotted, okay. But I believe that uh, we're living in a time when there's going to be Esra's and Nehemiah's and Deborah's mm -hmm. all over the world. Exactly. Uh, who will call people to come back to the Lord. And we're not going to look at women, men, or whatever. This is really, truly nonsense. Uh, no, uh, th th there's perhaps not going to be any more ordination. And uh, people are not worried about. We have a job to do. And yeah. it involves everyone who is a child of our living Father. If someone brings a hundred people to the gospel, you're going to say, I'm sorry, we can't baptize you because the person who brought you here was not ordained? Ah, just completely crazy. There's not going to be any organized church. Yeah. Uh, we're going to see that very quickly. Yeah. Well, Nehemiah chapter 4 talks about what happened after Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem. What was that sequence very quickly? Remember? What was like the first thing he did? He rested for three days. He walked then he went out at night at with a few very closely trusted friends walked around the wall. In fact, some places there was so much rubble his donkey couldn't even make it through. Walked all the way around, made notes. He said, yeah, I can see here and here and here and then. So, and then what happened? He called all the Jews together and he says, we are going to fix this wall. And they were amazed at how much he already knew. He had everything planned out. He knew what needed to be done. So that kind of story just inspires people. When you see someone who's... And he told about his experiences and, the, and how God had blessed him and brought him here safely and the, the permissions and things he'd gotten from the, from the emperor. And so, and 52, layers, 52 days later, what happened? The wall was finished. The wall was finished. And was that just easy? They just went ahead and built the wall? There was no problems? No. They had tremendous opposition. And what happened with that opposition? Well, the opposition kind of fell by the wayside. They could not they could not war against them for some reason. Yeah. And they just, they went forward with the wall despite every threat against them. Ellen White gives us some clues in there in addition to what the scripture says. For one thing, there were a number of Jews living outside and around. And so every time they would start to plan, okay, we're going to get a group together and we're going to attack the wall, some Jew from over there would secretly tell the message to, send the message to uh, Nehemiah, and they were prepared. Every time the, these enemies would try to attack, whoop, they're ready. And they, they finally give up. And f then they said, well, okay, we need to negotiate. Why don't you come on over to our place and we'll negotiate. And they saw immediately through that yeah. that all they were trying to do was to divert. Well, they were, they were going to get their hands on Nehemiah and kill him. Mm -hmm. There is no question about that. So how do we explain that kind of courage? Conviction. Yeah. Conviction that he was also a partner with God. Yes. yes. He absolutely believed that he was doing God's will and God was on his side. Amen. He wasn't just doing something foolish. He carefully prayed. He fasted. He talked to God about it. And he said, okay. Now, he didn't do something else that some people would do. He didn't say, okay, God, this is your job. We'll sit back and let you do it. No, what did he do? He said, we're going to get out there. And if our enemies attack, we're going to have someone standing there beside the workers with a sword and a spear. In fact, at one point in time, he had a spear in his side, in his holster or whatever, and, and working on the wall and had his sword handy. Wow. Well, to inspire the... Now, there's sometimes that we, we think highly of those who stand back and wait for God to do it. Mm -hmm. Like the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. You know, they couldn't do it. They needed God to do it. But sometimes we, we like Ezra and Nehemiah, they took it in their own hands. Where is the balance? Well, don't you think they had information from God that that was what they were supposed to do? 
I don't know. I think they probably did, but I don't know. Well, building walls is a rather... It's a human thing. I mean, we can build... Uh, we we sort of know how to build ra- walls, and, yeah. and people who are especially inspired can give us special techniques, but parting the Red Sea... That was a little, a little that's beyond human. <laughs> beyond well, human. They didn't even think of parting the Red Sea. They didn't have any idea what was going to happen. No. no. As the Egyptian army out. came across them. About the, look at the ten plagues. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay. Nehemiah and certain. What was God trying to teach with those things? There's a difference in yes. in the people of Israel. There's a very there's a very specific verse that I probably should read to answer that question. It's found in Exodus 12, verse 12. Let's see if we can go there really quick. Exodus 12, verse 12. On that night, this is talking about the destruction of the firstborn. On that night, I will go through the land of Egypt, this is God speaking, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing who? All the the gods gods of of Egypt. I am the Lord. In other words, they had Pharaoh each time had tried to say, "Well, our God, this this God, whichever it was, he could protect us from this God of yours." And another one lined up. Well, this God will protect us. And God just, I mean, in order to make it very clear, he had to directly attack each one of the gods of the Egyptians. So all of those plagues were the gods of Egypt. Made it, made to stink or yes. whatever. All the flies, all the frogs, all the, the Nile River. Many of you know a friend of all of ours who uh, used to teach these classes, Dr. Graham Maxwell, used to say, well, imagine sweeping up a whole bunch of dead frogs into a stinking pile and then, oh, let's see, check the calendar. Tonight it's time to, to pray to God Frog. So you would say, dear God Frog, Please bless mommy and daddy and help us to be more like, oh no, I don't want to say that. <laughs> no, just think of how foolish it would, it would seem if, if you were expecting to worship these gods that had just been destroyed. And, that, and that's, yet that's what they did. Mm-hmm. And all these plagues were on things that they worshipped. Exactly. You know, what really? Uh, I do not know. I don't have an answer. The Philistines take the ark, put it in their temple, Ashrath falls. Setting up again, Dagon. false again. Dagon. Uh, yes. And then uh, then we look into the temple itself mm-hmm. of the Lord. And all this nonsense is going on, <laughs> including prostitutes mm-hmm. in the Lord's temple. And he says, you know, then the Lord says, you are defiling the house, my house, my sure. father's house of worship. One thing that I really, truly want to mention, that he, even though he knew that all kinds of nonsense was going on, um, this is my father's house. We need to, for me, I don't think we should be questioning paying tithes and offerings. Mm-hmm. We are not the one. The Lord says, bring the tithes and offerings to my house. I've struggled with this for years. Yeah, You wonder... Were there some people coming to the temple and tried to wor- trying to worship correctly God while prostitutes are milling around? And I mean, I just anyway, we need to move on. The time is going. Gordon, I think you have something about Nehemiah from Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page six six zero. In Nehemiah's firm devotion to the work of, of God and his equally firm reliance on God lay the reason of the failure of his enemies to draw him into their power. The soul that is indolent falls an easy prey to temptation, but in the life that has a noble aim, an absorbing purpose, evil finds little foothold. The faith of him who is constantly advancing does not weaken, for above, beneath, beyond, he recognizes infinite love, working out all things to accomplish his good purpose. God's true servants work with a determination that will not fail because the throne of grace is their constant dependence. Amen. Wow. Well, back in Persia, long ways to the east, after fasting and praying for four months, Nehemiah had received that strong endorsement from the Persian Empire. 
emperor. He had also previously received the endorsement of God himself. So if you really were... Suppose you believed that God had commissioned you to do a certain job and you also had the backing of the most powerful person in the world, would you go forward? Of course. That seems like a rational thing to do, doesn't it? Well, we've, we've talked a little bit more about Nehemiah. What about Ezra? What, what, what did he do when he got there? Uh, Myra? Well, Ezra 7, uh, verses 8 to 10. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year that Artaxerxes was king. Ezra left Babylon on the first day of the first month and arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. I'd have to write this all out, figuring out what day is what. Mm -hmm. With God's blessing, the trip went well. Ezra had always given his time and his attention to studying and obeying the law of the Lord. He also loved to teach its rules and commandments to others in Israel. Wow. So both Ezra and Nehemiah realized how badly their ancestors, who have had previous lessons about this, had sinned and departed from God's plans for them. But they saw that God was in the process of opening up ways for them to return to the promised land. They looked back to the story of Moses leading the children of Israel out uh, out of Egypt, and they said, man, if God could get the children of Israel out of Egypt, it should be easy now and believe that experience could be repeated. These two men, like other great leaders, set themselves a specific goal. So what what is one of the characteristics of a good leader? He has a goal in mind. Under the guidance of God, they did not allow anything to deter them from that goal. They had purpose-driven lives. Both Ezra and Nehemiah wanted to see the country of Judah reestablished in the kingdom of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, protected from its enemies. But they wanted more than just material restoration. They wanted a spiritual renewal that would have meant future prosperity for the children of Israel. They believed that that is what God wanted also. Wow. Was it foolish for Ezra and Nehemiah to leave Persia with a group of refugees? Uh, In the case of Ezra particularly, they were literally carrying millions of dollars worth of gold and silver. And did they ask for an escort to take care of them? No. To protect them? They no. Did not. And why didn't they? They had they trusted in the... And they also yeah. felt guilty. If, if we talk about the greatness of this God and we ask for an escort, we're saying we really don't believe he can protect us. Yeah. We've got to do this without the escort. So what did they do? They, they gathered together. They knelt and prayed together and fasted together and took off. Four months through hostile territory and nobody bothered them. You think that was just coincidental? No. No. Not just coincidental. It will be interesting to see that video. Mm-hmm. People that tried. And we will see it. Yes. We yeah. will see it. Yeah. Now you think sandstorms came up or what something. do you think Angels, happened to those something. people who, who tried to attack them? I I I suspect that most, in most cases God probably just prevented those people from even thinking about it. Let's hope so. I, I mean, I, obviously I don't know, but... Well, look at Nehemiah 5. During all the 12 years that I was governor of the land of Judah from the 20th year to, that Artaxerxes was emperor until his 32nd year, neither my relatives nor, my, nor I ate the food I was entitled to have as governor. Every governor who has been in office before me had been a burden to the people and had demanded 40 silver coins a day for food and wine. How much is 40 silver coins? 40 days wages. That's 40 days wages. Even their servants had oppressed the people, but I acted differently because I honored God. I put all my energy into rebuilding the wall and did not acquire any property. Everyone who worked for me joined in rebuilding. I regularly fed at my table 150 of the Jewish people and their leaders, besides all the people who came um, to me from, from the surrounding nations and so forth. He also, it doesn't say it in these verses, but he also paid for a number of Jewish slaves that had been sold to their enemies to bring them back. Amazing. But Nehemiah believed that God would sustain him even if he made no claim for a large salary. We don't even know where Nehemiah got all that money. But he humbly served the people of Jerusalem. He used a lot of money. 
supporting all those people. I mean, imagine if you were pe- feeding Myra. Yeah. You're a great hostess. Can you imagine feeding 150 people three times a day? I can't imagine feeding even 15. Yeah. Yeah, 15 costs your fortune just for that. Mm. He refused the salary which he could have claimed as governor. Well, Jesus had some words to, for his disciples. Jesus sat down, called the 12 disciples, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must place himself last of all and be the servant of all. Wow. So when, it, when his disciples said that, they must serve others, was that a reflection of what Nehemiah had done? Yes. It really was, pretty much, wasn't it? We need to remember that the true leaders do not just tell others what to do, they join them and work together for God's cause. And I think you have something on that, Jim. The work of restoration and reform carried on by the returned exiles under the leadership of Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah presents a picture of a work of spiritual restoration that is to be wrought in the closing days of this earth's history. The remnant of Israel were a feeble people, exposed to the ravages of their enemies, but through them God purposed to preserve in the earth a knowledge of himself and of his law. They were the guardians of the true worship, the keepers of the holy oracles, Varied were the experiences they, that came to them as they rebuilt the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. Strong was the opposition that they had to meet. Heavy were the burdens borne by the leaders of this work. But these men moved forward in unwavering confidence, in humility of spirit, in firm reliance upon God, believing that he would cause his truth to tri- triumph. Like King Hezekiah, Nehemiah claved to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, and the Lord was with him. 2 Kings 18, verses 6 and 7, this is from Eight Patriarchs and Prophets by Ellen White. Prophets and Kings. Excuse me, Prophets and Kings, I'm sorry, I should have known better. Um, Page 677. Okay, wow. So... Do we have leaders like that today? If not, we're going to have very quickly all over the world, I'm convinced. I one time had an absolutely amazing experience in the country of Tanzania. We invited a gentleman who at that time was actually working as in the General Conference and Ministerial Department to come out and have a, 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 a sort of a, a, not really a camp meeting, an inspirational time for our pastors um, to to inspire them. And he came with his stories, amazing. He graduated, This he, he came from South America. He graduated from our college there, was looking for a job. The conference president came to him and says, okay, I want you to work here as a junior pastor for one year. So he went and he did one year. Then he called him back. He said, okay, now, I'm sending you to a place where there's not a single Adventist a city where there's not a single Adventist, when you have raised up 200 Adventists, built a church, and dedicated it, I will ordain you. What would happen if that was the goal for every pastor today? Which was the goal? Ordination or the building up of the church? All of the above. Yeah. And he, I mean, that was just the beginning. The other things he did were just amazing. The stories went on and on. Just, you would just stand there with your mouth hanging open. Hearing, I mean, and I mean, this is obviously was obviously a man. He's he was an elderly man then, so he's probably gone by now. But uh, I mean, this is a guy who relied on God's spirit, and and he was a servant leader. He was a servant leader. Amen. Yeah. Well, both Ezra and Nehemiah had lives that were constantly being guided by God through prayer and fasting. Do we know how to live that kind of life? Do you know? And Not really. they didn't fasting didn't mean abstaining completely from all food, uh, necessarily. Sometimes they would go on a limited diet of say only fruit or or something like that, a, a simple diet, a very simple diet, uh, abstaining from meat, for example, that kind of stuff. Um, but in, if you if you're doing that and you're asking God's guidance, if a crisis arises, uh, you know what to do. 
Well, in the early lessons of this quarter, we read passages from Nehemiah 8. Remember what happened in Nehemiah 8? The reading of the scripture. The reading of the scripture. Ezra stood up. He had gone around to people. He would collected different portions of scripture. So he got up there and he was reading in what language? Hebrew. Hebrew. What was the language of the people at that point in time? Aramaic. Aramaic. Those are related languages, but they're, they're significantly different. And so what did he do? He had people on both sides of him stretched out. And what were they doing? They were inter- translating and then interpreting and explaining what, they had, what Ezra had read. Wow. And people rejoiced and wept because for the first time they had understood God's plan for them as directly as it came from, from inspired records. Well, I, there was an enormous reformation. And it's interesting, everyone who was old enough to understand went home rejoicing because all the people had understood what God's word said to them. Ezra and Nehemiah arrived at the scene about 80 years after the first returnees had arrived in Jerusalem under Zerubbabel and Joshua from Babylon and Persia. Why do you think God had to wait that long before finding the right circumstances for doing what they did? Was it there was no one earlier that could, could and would follow God's plans for Jerusalem and the Jews? Did God have to wait for the right person? Did other plans fail? Did God call others? And we know that, that there were, they had tried to rebuild at least parts of the wall earlier and their enemies had just come and done what? Burned it down, break it down, burn it down. Did God call others and they declined to follow God's plan? Because of the relationship with God and their dependence upon Him, Ezra and Nehemiah demonstrated courage, fortitude, energy, generosity to bring about the work that needed to be done. They went about that work humbly and with a determination that could not be thwarted. They were honest, transparent, and persevering. Ezra and Nehemiah did not have time to waste doing frivolous things. Their very lives depended on being alert 24-7, as we say, every minute of every day and every night. At one period in time, Nehemiah did not even take off his clothes at night so that he would be ready in case of an enemy attack that could have happened at any moment. And of course, when would be the likeliest time for enemies to attack? Nighttime, right? Well, are we dedicating our lives by daily and hourly prayer to finishing the gospel in our day? Are we dedicating ourselves to a careful understanding of Scripture and earnest prayer and fasting as they did to accomplish the necessary goals? Ezra was recognized as a scholar in the Word of God before he even began the part of his life that we know about. As we've seen in earlier lessons, Ezra was a diligent student, even of the beliefs and practices of paganism in in, in Persia. He knew about those evil practices. But although he knew about those pagan practices, Ezra firmly set his mind to follow the one true God. Okay, now a question. Would you have joined Ezra in that perilous journey to Palestine? It would have taken tremendous courage because you didn't know what was going to happen. You had no idea what was in in front of you. You knew it was going to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And you knew that you didn't know what you had in terms of resources to get the job done when you got there. And remember, almost everyone who followed him had spent their entire lives in either Babylon or Persia or both. They didn't know what they were going to. And about 50,000 of them went? Yes. Well, no, Ezra was only six or 7,000. The 50,000 were back in the days of Zerubbabel. But this time, six or 7,000 people mm-hmm. joined Ezra and off they went to an unknown land, like Abraham. There may have been others other than Ezra, because he was not acting in a vacuum. He no. would have had others that were fasting and praying and he would have yeah. gone over uh, God's, the scriptures because obviously he used them to translate to the people yeah. uh, when he got there, so there were there were others under him, I think, who yeah. shared yeah. shared kind of that vision, and that may have been passed on to some of the other. Do people. Do you think it was just the poor and homeless who were willing to follow him, or were there some ses- successful business people who were willing to leave everything behind and follow Ezra? I think both are true. The fact is, you had to have people of strong will. If you didn't. 
yeah. the job wouldn't have gotten done. Yeah. To me, I believe uh, the reason why they followed, and perhaps even big people in uh, they saw Yahweh in the lives of these folk. Mm -hmm. That's why they went. Mm -hmm. Well, with Nehemiah, we, we know that he, he got that bad news from Jerusalem. So he started praying and everything worked out. He had the skills. You know, you wouldn't normally pick out a wine taster as being the, the person who's the next governor. <laughs> but that's what happened. Hey, listen, God's ways are not our ways. Yeah. And he's mm -hmm. willing to use what we give him mm -hmm. in spite of us. So a question for you. As a Sabbath school class or a church group, have you ever set aside a day for fasting and prayer for some important uh, thing that needed to be done in your area? Mm -hmm. What things could we do to encourage unselfish giving among other church among our church members? Have you ever been tempted just to give up because it seemed like it was too difficult? Do you think Ezra or Nehemiah ever thought this is an impossible task? Were they ever tempted to think that? Or do they oh, just sure. say, no problem, we'll just charge ahead? Well, sure, they, they would have seen the, the reality of the whole situation, but in faith they moved forward. And if you had been with Nehemiah on that night vision, that night trip around Jerusalem, would you have thought, oh, this is an easy job? I'm sure he saw many gates and walls that had been burned down from previous attempts, and he must have thought, wow, are we going to really do this? But he had trust in God and he said, I know we can do this. We will. And the next morning or within a more, two or three days or something, else, he called all the Jews together and he said, we're going to do this. And, and he didn't doubt it. And he, and he spoke with such conviction that people said, yeah. Here's a man that knows what he's doing. He has an idea in mind. He's made his preparation. He's made his plans. That's the kind of person I'd like to follow. Well, have you learned from your personal religious experience? Are there promises that you regularly claim from the Bible in your relationship with God? There's a lot of problems. You know, there's some people who read the Bible just for the promises. There's a lot of promises in the Bible. How many of those promises have you claimed for yourself? Think about it. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to study your word, to think of wonderful experiences of people like Ezra and Nehemiah and to take courage from what they did. May we have the courage necessary to take up the work that you've given us and to finish it here so that all of us can go home and live with you forever is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.